which commandment in the law is the greatest? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are not far from the kingdom of God. You may be seated. Before we move into the service, I want to introduce a special guest, um, the Reverend Barry Chance. He is the new um, Executive General Presbyter and Stated Clerk of Eastminster Presbytery. Many of you remember Kathy Ulrich, who had stopped by from time to time. She retired um, at the end of January, and Barry is the new person. <laughs> And um, he decided to stop by here on his way to East Palestine. He heard he had to go to East Palestine now to get on TV. So um, <laughs> he did want to come down this Sunday. Um, so Barry, you wanted to bring greetings. So the music stand is yours. The music stand is mine. It's a beautiful music stand. <laughs> Let's try this. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Someone trained you well. <laughs> I'm delighted to be with you here today. Uh, I uh, This is my first official Sunday visit uh, with a congregation. I've been going back and forth between uh, Louisiana, where I've been for the last 17 years, and Ohio for the last few weeks. But now I'm sort of here. I've taken up semi-permanent lodging in the Extended Stay Hotel. Uh, <laughs> while we figure out uh, more details, my family is moving up at the end of the school year. But delighted to be with you. I did have an opportunity to get the nickel tour from Fritz a few weeks ago when I was in town. Uh, didn't expect uh, the circumstances, but uh, look forward to coming back and getting a, a, a more detailed, but excited by some of the creativity and compassion that he described uh, in this community coming from this congregation. Uh, I'm here to be your cheerleader, uh, to uh, try to hope connect you with other congregations and resources as we try to labor together in the gospel. So thank you for having me this morning. Thank you, Barry. Let us worship. If you're able, please stand. We're going to sing that first hymn that we just practiced. Come to me, number 180. During Lent, as I, as I said before, and as we've done before, um, we're going to be engaging in a um, deeper and a little more lengthy prayer exercise instead of the normal prayer of confession. Um, a challenge to really look at ourselves, look at our world and see where hurt and pain is happening and lift them up to God. We're gonna do this every week. It's gonna be exactly the same every week. Hopefully you can um, kind of just settle into it so it can become a routine and discipline. And um, we'll also be chopping this out and putting it online so that if you want to use this as a Lenten devotional, you can. So we're going to start by singing that um, song that we just practiced, Goodness is Stronger Than Evil. Then I'm going to lead you through a series of reflections. <laughs> then we're going to um, hear how in light of our pain our god responds and then we're going to end with um, a good classic hymn at the cross um but we're going to sing it a little mixed up so the words are in the bulletin uh, that, that's, that's an official word today a little mixed up -y. I didn't see that in Austin. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's there. So we're going to do the opening song. I'm going to lead you in a series of reflections 
Uh oh. We're gonna let Regan just. You're fine. <laughs> if you want to give up, you can give up too. That's okay. <laughs> um, and then we're gonna close it with "At the Cross," sung a little mixed up. -y. So, goodness is stronger than evil. of God in this place where we come to pray every week. The presence of God above you. The presence of God below you. The presence of God beside you on your left, on your right, in front of you, behind you. Feel the presence of God and know you are loved. As you sit in God's presence, I invite you to ask yourself, where are you hurting or in pain today within yourself, within your being? Where are you hurting or in pain today? within yourself, within your being. Name how you hurt and lift it up to God. I invite you to ask yourself, where are you hurting or in pain on behalf of others? Where are you hurting or in pain on behalf of others? Name those places where you hurt for others. And ask God to help those for whom you hurt. Listen to the ways God might be calling you to respond to their pain. I invite you to ask yourself in what ways have your actions caused hurt? and pain to yourself or to others? In what ways have your actions caused hurt and pain to yourself or to others? Name your actions to God and the hurt they may have Ask God to forgive you for your actions and to heal those whom you may have hurt. Thank you. 
Finally, I invite you to ask yourself, in what ways have the direct actions of others or the collective sins of the world caused hurt and pain to you? In what ways have the direct actions of others or the collective sins of the world caused hurt and pain to you? Name to God the ways you have been hurt by others. Ask God for healing. And if you can, only if you can, pray for the one who hurt you. Now I invite you to hear how our God describes the divine self. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So bad things, bad things, it, it's the whole bad things thing has gotten a little crazy recently around here. I, I, I mean, it's, it's gotten, gotten surreal. I mean, you have Eric, Aaron Brockovich and Donald Trump competing for media share in East Palestine. <laughs> I, I just learned, Linda told me that um, National Fox News had the First United Presbyterian Church in East Palestine on it this morning. So I'm, I'm, they better add more communion for next week. I, <laughs> um, you, you, Joe, I was meeting Joe for lunch at Carla and she texts me, Rudy's here. I was like. I know they did. 
Right, you smile, see me Saturday Night Live? I mean, this is getting crazy. But it's also gotten me thinking a lot of how did we get to this place? How did we get, not just the media circus and all the political stuff that brought that here, but how did we get into this mess? How did this mess happen? How is it playing out in our communities, in our lives? How do we find ourselves caught in this space where it's not just one thing? I mean, th this isn't just, you know, an engineer fell asleep at the wheel. It, it's this whole cascading web of stuff, layers and layers and layers of stuff that ultimately, theologically, we can go back and say, we are seeing firsthand sin in its many, many, many ways and permutations at work in our community trapping us, trapping the entire community, trapping human society, layers of sin that do lead to death. Physical death, but luckily there hasn't been any of that in East Palestine yet. But certainly emotional death, spiritual death, psychological death, relational death, communal death, for sin can kill us, can kill a community without taking a, a single life. Mm -hmm. So this being Lent, <coughs> time for reflection, we're going to turn our attention the next few weeks to sin, to our relationship with God, how entire societies relate to God. And we're going to unpack a lot of this. We're also going to reflect on Christ's transformative power to defeat sin and resurrect our sin-soaked world. We're going to be talking about our own personal sin, but trust me, I'm not going to be focusing too much on that. What interests me more as I unpack what's going on around us are the levels of how sin works in our society. Gener how sin moves across generations, how sin moves through entire societies, and the danger that comes when that moves into not only sin in our relationships, but sin in our spiritual lives. And over and over and over again, this is going to be joyful, I promise you, because over and over and over again, we're going to see how Christ can and does come in, work in us, work through us to bring new life to people, to communities, to destroy by sin. So this week, we're going to start at the very beginning. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 3. This is a story that's in every Sunday school book. It's a story of a couple, Adam and Eve, living in paradise with God and what happens when they encounter a tree and a serpent. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, 
knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree would, was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate and the eyes of the both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed big leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze and the man and his wife hid him themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God said to the man, and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to me to be with you, the woman whom you gave to be with me she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate. The story continues and the end result is that Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden and lose access to paradise. I have a vivid memory of a moment. I was 12 or 13. I was old enough to know right from wrong, old enough to be responsible for my behavior. And I remember walking into the kitchen one afternoon and seeing my mother squatting before the open refrigerator, probably looking for those three week old leftovers that she knew was there and had plans for it. And I remember sneaking up behind my mother as she squatted there and giving her a push. To this day, I have no idea why I sent my mother crashing into the refrigerator shelves. I wasn't mad at her. I wasn't having a bad day. I wasn't a difficult or troubled child. I simply walked into the kitchen, saw an opportunity to cause a major disruption to my mother's center of gravity, and I took it. I walked up behind her and pushed. Why do we do things that we know are bad, that we do not ourselves approve of, but still do them? Paul asks us that, asks himself that. He says that he does not do what he wants, but he does the very thing he hates. Right? This is, this is our life. We, we regularly do things that we know we're not supposed to do. Either we do things that hurt or hinder ourselves. We do things that hurt or hinder the people we love. We do things that hurt or hinder society as, as a whole. We just, we can't in our own lives escape this underlying power of sin. And even if we manage to, even if we were like Christ and managed to live completely sin-free lives, well, just, Sin is what put Jesus on the cross. So he was able to live that sin-free life, but he still was affected by sin. We cannot escape it. Jesus did nothing to put himself on the cross. 
The average citizen in East Palestine did absolutely nothing to warrant a train exploding with toxic chemicals blocks from their houses. <laughs> Sin is just there. It's always been. It will always be with us individually, collectively, socially. It's just there. Scripture tells us that the first humans, Adam and Eve, were in paradise, everything perfect, everything provided, no hurt, no pain, no tears, no marital spats, no chemical spills. Just one rule that they were to follow. Don't eat of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. And honestly, between you and I, we'd all be better off if God had never put that tree in the middle of that garden and said, don't eat. Because as you know, the serpent, the tempter, the troublemaker dares the first couple to eat of the fruit. And of course, because when you're dared not to do something, you do it, they eat. Paradise is over, murder and mayhem, lying and stealing, selfishness and injustice, hurt, pain, more tears than the molecules that are in the sea, all follow. In church speak, we call this moment in our human story, the original sin. And we call the sense of pervasive sin in which we live original sin. Indeed, I was born guilty, David confesses in his monumental Psalm 51. Those of you in the David class, we're getting there mm -hmm. this week. The Psalm written in response to his raping of Bathsheba, his killing of Bathsheba's husband, and then his forcing of Bathsheba into his harem, a nice little succession of sin. And David reflects, I was guilty as I was born. Original sin is why we baptize children who have yet to consciously sin and declare their sins forgiven. The ancient Christian theologian saw this original sin as something somehow genetically transmitted. They didn't understand genetics, but that's basically where they arrived at. Passed down from mother to child across the generations. I prefer a different analogy, less genetics and more Groundhog Day. Every day, each one of us wakes up and whether we like it or not, whether we want to or not, we manage to sin. And then we sin again, whether we want to or not, kind of like Dean when told to sit still gets up and runs around and when told to sit gets up and runs around and told to sit gets up and runs around. This is how we are. This is how we are. Sometimes we realize that we've sinned and we repent and we sin again. Sometimes sin is so ingrained in us that we don't even realize we sin. And sometimes we think we're doing right and we still manage to sin. It's quite a conundrum. That's why we're spending six weeks on it. We sin in ways that hurt ourselves. We sin in ways we hurt that hurt others. Over the hours, over the days, over the generations, our sin collects and festers and expands and grows until it hits that roadblock that is Jesus Christ. Just as sin came into the world through one man, Paul tells us, referring to that original story about a couple in paradise, a tree, a serpent, and how death came through sin, referring to that murder and mayhem, hurt, pain, and tears that followed, 
and telling us that out of that sin, death spread to all because all have sinned, referring to that Groundhog Day in which we live and find ourselves. So one man, this would be Jesus, his act of righteousness, this would be Jesus's willingness to allow a sinful people to put him on a cross leads to justification and life for all. Justification being the act of being made through the free gift of God's grace, being made right with God and being given a life that is in fullness and richness because we're no longer burdened by the sin that weighs us down. In a sin-filled world dragging us all toward death, we receive life beyond anything we can imagine through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the good news of the gospel. Sin sucks life out of us. Jesus Christ puts life back in us. Sin is bigger, much bigger than our personal decisions and our personal behaviors. Much bigger than our own lying, cheating, and stealing. That forms the tip of a huge iceberg dragging humanity away from the life gift promised to us by God. And Jesus's salvation is much bigger than simply a golden ticket to get us into heaven. Jesus's salvation is bigger than our own personal faith. When we repent of our sin and turn to Christ Jesus, we're tapping into an existing life force working in ways beyond what we can even imagine. One day as an adult, I brought up the incident of childhood maternal assault <laughs> to my mother. It was, I believe, in the months before my mother's death, when it seemed like we should probably clear the air, repent of our sins, and confess those things that honestly my mother probably would have preferred not to know in the first place. <laughs> I was surprised this incident so seared in my brain that I can see it right now had been completely forgotten by her. For decades, I've been holding a mix of guilt combined with bewilderment at my childhood actions. And I remember that at the time, she'd reacted appropriately, a little shocked, a little surprised, and some small amount of pain by being face planted into the refrigerator, <laughs> and more than a little angry. I assume I was appropriately punished, but I do not remember what that was. And then she moved on. She'd forgiven me. She'd restored to me, to my rightful place as her one and her only beloved son. I'm her only son, so I'm certain <laughs> that I am her one and only beloved son. Sin and grace, pain and healing, a cycle interrupted. We see the Groundhog Day we're in. We see it every day. Everything from hurting those we love to exploding rail cars full of toxins. And we wonder if there's a way out, if there's an end to this. If the tears will ever stop if the anger will ever subside, sin comes in and Christ takes it out. The alarm goes off and finally there's a new song on the radio and through Christ 
the day finally changes. We can, in this sin-soaked world, in our sin-soaked community, we can and do become new. Let's sing. I forget what we're singing. Oh, there's power in the blood. If you're able, stand up. If you want to, run around. It's okay. Thank you, Mary. enter into a time of prayer. Holy and gracious God, we lift up to you where we hurt. We lift up to you where we need comfort. We lift up to you where we need healing. We give you thanks that you are the one who intervenes as the dominoes fall. You take from death and you bring back we ask, Lord, that you be with those who are in suffering, those who are in pain. Be with Dean as he goes to surgery tomorrow. Be with Paul Brown and his family as they walk that final journey. Be with others who are hurting, who need healing. Be, Lord, in East Palestine. We know that your presence there will last longer than the media circus. That the 15 minutes will get over and then they'll be left. So we ask, Lord, for your healing. We ask for promises made to become promises kept. We ask, Lord, for the anger and the rancor and the distrust to become resolved in a community working together. We ask, Lord, that you be with the way station as they, in a time of exhaustion, in a time when their resources have been stretched to the max, are given an opportunity to look ahead and see what can be done for a community and for a county. We pray, Lord, for our sister church as they too wonder what a small group can do in a time of such need. Put your strength, Lord, in that community. Let your love be shown and known. Lord, we pray for our broken and hurting world. We ask, Lord, that you bring peace across the corners. 
We ask, Lord, that you bring hope where hope seems far away and where there is hatred and violence and prejudice and systematic hurt and pain. We ask, Lord, that your love will flow like a river, like a resounding stream. And Lord, as we sit here, we ask that you let your presence be known to us, that you empower us to be your people as you are our God, that you hear us as we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to end in our closing circle with our new closing song so you can take your bulletins to the closing circle i didn't have to, i was gonna like paint it on the walls so you did, but i didn't have time um, Love some sinner. Forgive some sinner. Love someone only a mother can love. And discover perhaps in return that you are the sinner in need of forgiveness. You are the one someone else found unlovable. Go now and know that as you do, the one whom we know as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit goes with you. Because that one was with you yesterday is with you now, and will be with you always. Amen. Amen. Amen.